Hey, this is Jules Taylor, host of No Easy Answers. I just wanted to thank everyone for their continued support. Please like and subscribe to this podcast. Tell your friends. And if you haven't already become a supporter, please consider supporting the podcast by heading to www.anchor.fm forward slash no easy answers and click the support button. We couldn't do it without you. Here's episode 10 in its entirety. She told me after after my transplant, because I was going there on a regular basis, getting you know what trying to save my life, and and after my transplant, I went in and she's like, well, you you don't have to be a patient anymore of mine, because she was like a, a hepatologist, liver doctor. She's like, your liver's fine now, and and she told me, she said, you're the first one I've had that lived. Today is Saturday, October 24th. The year is 2020. This is No Easy Answers, and I am your host, Jules Taylor. Today, like all days, I have no easy answers for you. Today on the show is another longtime friend of mine, Brandon Villarreal. He's a guy I met while I was still too young to legally drink or buy my own smokes. This is the guy who took me to my first strip club when I was still underage. He's like an older brother to me in a lot of ways in that he was always down to get into trouble and he was sometimes a bad influence, but you need friends like that in life and aside from drinking and raising hell, he's also the person who first encouraged me to apply for a job in radio and that was a step that would set in motion the rest of my adult life and career. He and I are long overdue for catching up and of course that's part of why I wanted to have him come on the show. But the other reason is that Brandon received a new liver a while back, and being a transplant survivor, he's got a new lease on life. He's taken up drone photography, he's out in nature taking hikes, he's road tripping, and I get the feeling he's really enjoying his life. Brandon went through a seminal event that qualitatively changed him. I wanted to focus a lens on his life and story, because it's remarkable and it deserves to be heard. So here's my conversation with Brandon Villarreal. You know, welcome to the podcast. Here we are, and um, I'm happy to see you. And I am. Uh, it's it's been a while since we've talked, um, and I know you've gone through a bunch of shit, and and yeah. we'll we'll get into that, man. Um, and you know, at some point, I'll I'll turn over this, uh, you know, sort of platform thing to to let you say as much or as little as you're comfortable with. Um, because uh, I think it's an, a really interesting story, and and I think that um, I'm, I'm part of the reason why I'm happy to see you is obviously because you survived this story, and for a little bit it, it didn't. I would think you didn't know if you were going to make it at all. Um, but before we get into all that, uh, you are in Michigan, which is a really crazy place. Because I, I mean, I met you in McAllen, Texas. So what? When did you go to Michigan, and why did you go up there? I came in here in June of 2017. I was actually born here, and I'm kind of like you in the fact that uh, half of my family are gringos and half are Mexicanos, <laughs> and the, the, the gringo side of my family is all from Michigan. So I got half my family here. I got half my family in Texas. And where we're from in Texas, it's, you know, we can just call it Mexico. Right. Um, uh, I don't know how much you talk about the valley. Uh, right, right. Um, how much people know about where we're from. But it's got, like, the best food in the country. Absolutely. And uh, the highest obesity rate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the cheapest, it's, it's the cheapest place to live. Um, it's getting smacked by COVID right now, real bad. Yeah. Yeah. I've only um, seen it on the news, man, with like stuff going on in McAllen and Mission. I mean, they seem to have got it worse than, yeah, it's, it's really bad down there. Yeah. And why I came here to get to your question, I had no other choice. I kind of ran out of places to crash. Oh, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. And I hadn't really seen my family up here in a while. So it's like, hey, you know, how you always say come visit. Well, how about it if you let me sleep on your couch for a while? <laughs> yeah. And that's I, I, what I did. I don't remember you having quite like the the mission gander sort of inflection in your voice. Uh, I can hear a bit of that uh, coming through, actually. Yeah, I'm weak. Wherever I go, I pick up the accent real quick. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's like almost Canadian, but not quite, you know. Uh, they got a lot of hardies. Michigander. Hey, yeah, how, yeah. how's it going up there? Uh. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> when I came up here, everyone said I had a Mexican accent. No oh, shit. Wow. Well, yeah, man. You know how I, we do it down there. I know that. You had this, uh, like this Tex Mex uh, inflection going on, you know. Um, I don't think you like you know, blended Spanish and English together all the time. Not really? Um, but sometimes, you know, be like, ah, chingao. Chingao. What yeah. the hell does chingao mean? It's my absolute favorite Mexican curse word. You know, um, <laughs> chingao is like so flexible. You're chingaderas. Uh, you can like modify it to do conjugated. So like, it's kind of like the word fuck and fucking and fucked and, and all these different like Fuck the fucking you, fuckers. The way you can use the word fuck, it's just as versatile with chingao uh, in, in Spanish. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. So tell, tell me, uh, other than like, you know, the food and uh, uh, the food and the cost of living being cheap and uh, the dirt weed along the border, um, what was it like for you growing up in the Rio Grande Valley? Because I know you, you, were, you got there pretty young, didn't you? I was two years old when I got there. Right. So I was born here and almost immediately moved there with my um, with my mom and my dad. My um, my dad raised me from the age of six weeks old, maybe even earlier than that. I'll, ha I'll have to ask him. But that's this seems the number that I usually remember. Six weeks old. Hmm. Um, my mom, when she met him, didn't tell him that she had a kid. And I guess <laughs> they, he was at Surprise. my mom's house. Yeah, and heard me crying or something. He's like, what the hell is that, you know? Wow. So, <laughs> but, yeah, because my biological dad, I only met him once, like, when I was 17 years old. But, um, so that was my dad growing up. Uh, you know, he's he's kind of dark-skinned, Mexican feller. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, used, I asked him when I was a kid, I'm like, hey, uh, when I grow up, am I going to be dark like you? And, you know... <laughs> No, I wasn't. So it's like they never, they never hid the fact or could hide the fact that he wasn't my real dad. Right, um, right. But at in I think I was in first grade uh, where he legally adopted me. So I became a Villarreal, mm. which is hard to spell um, in first grade when you're not used to it. I had just learned how to spell my other last name, which was Bumbleus. <laughs> it was Bumbleus, really? Bumbleus, yeah. Wow. I did not know that about you. Yeah. It it's very, it's very kind of similar to like, uh, I, I just had, I have a friend of mine who is uh, biracial and he's half black and we had a, a talk on the show at one point about um, a couple episodes ago or last episode, I forget right now. Um, anyway, but he, he was like, you know, he, he, when he grew up, he would point to his mother's skin color being white and he'd be like, I, I don't look like you. And, uh, and she'd break out the baby pictures and be like, no, actually you belong to me. This is how, you know? And, uh, so I, I would imagine like you had maybe a similar conversation actually to like what I had as a biracial person, because, uh, you know, at a certain point, I, you know, kids kind of figure it out. You're like, Hey, wait a second. You're not my real dad. Something's off here. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. I never really questioned it, and it was never even weird to me um, living in that culture until I came back up here for high school after my parents divorced. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was like, wow, this is a completely different world, and this I'm supposed to be like these people? You right. Because I, I looked like them, but, you know, it, it's totally different than, than the world that I know. Right. And I we kind of, I don't know about you, but like kind of grew up, on, I wouldn't say like criminals, right? But like kind of on the wrong side of the law. Like <laughs> how, do I, how do I explain this? Uh, it's a little more like the Wild West down there. And, and you, you do things that aren't necessarily 
things that are like normal there would ne- you would never ever do here. Like we would have fake insurance cards, and we would have <laughs> this guy <laughs> who would give us our vehicle registrations, right? Yeah, that, you know, and because we had to get our car inspected, but we could get them to go. They didn't even inspect the cars, and like everyone, <laughs> every single person you knew drove around with a beer in between their legs, and and you know, I remember as a kid smelling. Mota, we man in the car and it, yeah, you know, we weren't gangsters or anything, but it's just we we didn't they didn't take life so seriously down there, right? It's a slower pace for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean there is something like compelling about like you know and when it's hot as fuck outside and there's street tacos uh, and the best food in the in the world, man. Um, you know, having a couple drinks per day and eating some some really amazing tacos is is you know, it, that can turn into your everyday routine for sure. Uh, and I do miss <laughs> that, you know. Um, yeah, well, it did for me. That Right. That, the, the food, well, I moved up to Austin a couple of years before I moved here. And I I took the, the, the beer part with me, but I don't know, man. I couldn't. The tacos, you go five hours north and the tacos in Austin, Texas. You think of it as being a city in, in the south or like kind of like a Latin uh, city. No, yeah, man, it's still not as good. <laughs> no, it's drastically different. It's not as good. And it's and it's really wild, like the disparity that happens just a few hours north. You're right, man. Um, and like even up here, I, I kind of search for tacos up here and I I have to find like uh, these little hole in the wall places that are run by, uh, you know, Ecuadorian families or something like that, you know, yeah, to, which is different. Which is not the too. same. It's not, it's even good, but it's not yeah. the same. Yeah, these it really is not a lot of meat and stuff. Well, my my dad, he always called the Rio Grande Valley the land that God forgot. <laughs> there, there's a reason they don't put a border checkpoint to search for like illegal aliens and, and produce and stuff like that. Up in, like uh, an hour and a half, two hours north of the Rio Grande Valley, because in between the Rio Grande Valley and everything north or the rest of the United States, it's like desert. And it, it's wild. It's crazy. man. It's it's dry. There's hardly any any water there there's mm-hmm. uh wild the javelina yeah that roam through there uh, rattlesnakes and oh yeah and it's 120 degrees outside <laughs> right 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 right. yeah oh, I, and 90 percent humidity too yeah it's like the worst of both heats for sure and, and, <laughs> and i mean there's even like the rattlesnake roundup that happens down there where they just it's you know they it's like a festival where they just freer in Freer, Texas, and it, to my understanding, it's like this uh, competition of like who can round up the most rattlesnakes in a bag, which just seems completely insane. And um, <laughs> and when you walk around, I, I'm told about this. Like you can buy like a jar of spiders. I mean, this sort of shit shouldn't even like like who needs a well, jar of spiders for five bucks? Yeah, wow, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a it's a really uh, it's an alternative universe for sure. Um, when I met you, and we'll get into like how we met and all that. Um, but when I met you, you were like some sort of like state champion tuba player in your in your teenage years. But why did you choose the tuba? Like, how did that pairing happen? I didn't. I didn't choose the tuba. I um, I was in elementary school. And elementary school, and you get to pick your instrument. I chose the string bass. And oh, only, yeah. The only reason was because it was big. I'm like, right. oh, that thing's freaking huge. You know, I yeah, didn't yeah. necessarily like the sound of it or anything. You know, I just thought it was mm-hmm. kind of cool. So I did orchestra in uh, sixth grade uh, for one semester. Uh, within that semester, they moved me up to the eighth grade orchestra, uh, the top orchestra in the in the school by the end of the semester. Right. Uh, I had dreams of playing the bass in, in an orchestra. Uh, I was thinking about soon trying out for the the Rio Grande Valley Orchestra or McAllen Symphony Orchestra. I forgot what it was called, mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, and then, but that it wasn't going so good for me at that that school in sixth grade. It was it was um, in one of the bigger cities down there, McAllen. Uh, there's probably about a thousand junior high kids there, and maybe about fifty white people. And yeah. uh, I was getting bullied big time. Mm. Uh, there's, you know, it, it's a poor area. And the, so you got these underprivileged kids and you got gangs and and they they just love to beat the shit out of me. Fuck. <laughs> so yeah. 
So I had to leave that school and went to a uh, another school district where it was a little less rough, I guess, and I was more accepted. But they didn't have an orchestra. So I, I sat there in the band and they said, dude, we ordered you a bass. So you're going to play the string bass in a band, which isn't unheard of. It's kind of rare, you know. Right, right. But I'm like, cool. But while we're waiting for your bass, um, why don't you just grab a tuba? Huh. Wow. And so I'm like, OK, because for like a couple of weeks, I was just sitting there with the tubas, just looking at the music and just watching them play. And they're like, you know, here, just just hold on to this tuba. And then that's what I learned from then on. That bass never showed up, <laughs> never, found, never got the bass. <laughs> Holy shit. That's, yeah. that's, so, wow. Yeah. By the end of uh, junior high, I was I, I was pretty good, I guess. I, I didn't know I was good. I never made first chair or anything. And uh, then when I got to high school, had a they had a really good program, music program, and they gave mm-hmm. us lessons. And found out I was the only kid, the the only tuba player that could hit the high notes. And then they just uh, worked on me. And yeah, I was first chair in the valley in the region, mm. Mm. and um, on my way to state. And but I failed Spanish, so <laughs> no, no pass. <laughs> No pass, no play. Right. Oh, Christ, man. But but you're like you're fluent in Spanish, aren't you? Like how, oh, bro? You know how it is. Maybe maybe I wasn't that fluent back then. That like I I always thought you were like completely fluent in it. Um, and it, it's funny. It's like a, I I'm all about speaking some Spanish to impress people until someone that can actually speak Spanish shows up. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, here's, yeah. here's the thing. Spanish class was first period. Right. And uh, oh, I, was, yeah. I was kind of an alcoholic already at that time. <laughs> so I never, made, I never made it to first period class. Oh, man. What that's, age are we talking about here? What age are we What's talking that? about? What age are we talking about here? Oh, 15. Mm. 15 years old. Yeah, freshman in high school. You think you were had long ass hair? Like already by that point? Oh, man. I was like right away. Um, Whoa. Oh, dude, well, I would drink one beer a day. My my mom used to buy us beer. Just mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess she wanted someone to drink with or mm. to keep me home. I, I I don't know. I don't. I can't speak for her. I don't know what she. Sure, sure. You know what she we her my parents had just divorced. She wanted to be nice to me. I mm. was always kind of mature for my age. You know, like a little grown yeah. up only child, only child. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she would buy me one beer a day, and so I would pick. I picked out the Mickey's forty ounce. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my one beer. Wow. And when I first started drinking, that that was enough to really get you hammered. Right. I tried to have two, and two got me to the point of, of throwing up. Mm. So, yeah, one was pretty much all I needed for a long, long time. Wow, man. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's yeah. why my house was always fun to be at. <laughs> so when when I... When I met you, was that around that time? Like when I met yeah. you the very first time? I think I was fourteen when I met you. Okay, you were what? You were too younger than me. Because my I mom I, was. Yeah, I don't even. My remember mom was exactly. just divorced, and she somehow my, and I, I don't even. I don't want to call this guy my dad, but he's the guy that raised me. Um, but um, and I don't even talk to this guy anymore because. Uh, you know, I just there's just so much to disagree with him about, uh, including uh, being an awful father figure. You know, and um, I'm surprised he's alive at this point. Yeah, you know he that was, dude. He uh, was a, 500 pounds. I, I tell people, thank you for saying this. I tell people that I was raised by a dude that was like 500 pounds, and they're like, "You're exaggerating," and I'm like, "No, he no. was legit, 500 pounds." Um, yeah, this guy at least. I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> At least 500 pounds. He yeah. was a very large person. Yeah. And um, for, you know, for a small kid, um, it was super intimidating all the time, you know. Um, and uh, he was also like this shit kicking sort of cowboy uh, police officer for a long time growing up. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm a and he self- dated my mom. He dated your mom, dude. And and to be fair, he was uh, he wasn't a police officer at the time. He was a a parole officer. Um, but he was still like, I mean, he was a mean motherfucker too, man. Um, I so anyway, so he dated your mom, and uh, this That's guy, how I met. 
that that is how we met. Um, and I must have been twelve at the time. You were probably fourteen ish, right? And um, I and 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 also like I think my dad or I don't want to call him my dad, right? I said right, but and I still do out of habit at times. Uh, but and his name was Tom. But I think Tom. Uh, was very upset that you gave me a Megadeth T-shirt. Um, Google and, is euthanasia. Yeah, Google the album cover. Yeah, and uh, and I think he had just also like gone through this uh, Christian conversion thing that happened as well. Um, so it was it was an awful big enormous guy around five hundred pounds or more uh, who had this uh, Christian disposition that he forced on to his children and here i am sitting alone with a uh, 15 14 year old alcoholic son of the woman that he's dating and <laughs> and he uh did Pop not head. yeah and i think he told me that he uh that he actually stopped seeing your mother because uh because you were smoking pot at that age and he didn't want me to be under that sort of influence um yeah sure Right, right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Um, like I wasn't going to discover that at some point and rebel against a fucking cop, anyway. Well, know? like that was the reason they split. I mean, I'm not going to speak for them, but no. But I mean, that's what he had told me at the time, you know. Um, and then I just, I just never saw you again. And I think uh, Tom uh, literally used the Megadeth T-shirt to like wash his truck with fucking guy, you know. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that's. That is how you and I met, and we didn't meet again for a minute because I, I wasn't even in high school, and and I, and I want you to tell the story of how we kind of reunited because, like, I could tell that story, and I could, I could, and I, but I'm curious as to how you remember that and what that course of events was like. Uh, well, we, I don't remember it very well. Uh, well, you, were, you were pretty drunk too, so. Oh no, shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah, man. Um, um, well, you can tell it. Yeah, tell, tell us. Okay, story. here's what I remember. We used to go to Bill Shoe Park and uh, hang out um, all night and smoke weed and do all sorts of other illegal activities in the park. And I remember seeing you there with some girl, <laughs> and that's it. That's it. No shit. Mm-hmm. You were okay. like on your prom date or something. It was my prom date, man. Yeah, with like my high school sweetheart. And uh, did I know, hit on her? Uh, let me just let me just say the story <laughs> the way it is. Then okay, I'll, okay. I'll tell you what's up. All right. So I I had uh, I I had really planned this stuff out. It was prom night, and you know, at seventeen or something, or maybe eighteen. I'm not even. Oh, well, sure enough, wasn't like old enough to drink or buy cigarettes at the time. But I, you know, I I. I'd taken my high school sweetheart to uh, the park after prom because we didn't want to stay and dance or do anything like that. Um, and so we went to the park. I'm dressed in my tux and she's got her evening gown on or whatever. And um, and I had packed away like a, a pizza and uh, and like a bottle of sparkling grape juice and and a guitar because I was going to serenade this girl in the park. And, uh, and you and this guy, Trevor, like I was this young idealist, man, thinking I could woo this girl in the park with a guitar at the time, you know, that was the only avenue I knew to like picking up a, a, a chick at that point, um, was the guitar. That's why I learned guitar. Uh, right, right. A lot of people learn guitar for the girls. And, um, anyway, so you were like drinking and heckling me actually, dude, from like a, a whole bench way, like maybe 50 yards away. Like, but you were far enough to where you could yell and we could hear you. And it was like really killing the vibe because I was just trying to like play guitar <laughs> oh. to this girl, man. And, uh, and so eventually you walk over and with Trevor and, and now you're like, at some point, you like take the guitar from me and you started singing in Yiddish. Um, and my date was Hebrew. impressed. Uh, okay, Hebrew. Okay, not Yiddish. Um, uh, so, yeah, anyway, so you take the guitar from me, you sing to my date. And at this point, I was just like, I don't even care if I get my ass kicked by both these guys. Um, <laughs> um, Did you but, know who I was? And this is like the the a very offensive part. I'll I'll, I'll like apologize for this uh, ahead of time. But uh, but I I was getting ready to figure out how to take a, a clean shot at you or Trevor 
most probably I was looking more towards you. Like, how could I do that? I got to wait till he puts the guitar down because that's my guitar, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and Sounds I mean, I was a right. young kid and I was nervous as fuck, man. You guys were older. And I, this was like, like a real, like the thoughts going through my head was like, this is like a test of my manhood here, you know? And I'm, I, I'm here with this girl and she's clearly like entertained by this guy playing guitar better than I could and singing, which I wasn't really even a great singer. So or at the time, so I, I, Anyway, so but then I recognized you, and I didn't remember your name, but I, I, mm-hmm. I, 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 I remember it after I said the following. But I looked at you, and and for the backstory on this too is that when when my, I knew that when Tom had dated your mother, I knew that your mother had a, had a mastectomy from breast cancer, and I was intent on fighting you in that moment. So I I. Once I recognized you, I said the most offensive thing I could think of at the moment. And I and I said to you, like, your mother only has one tit. And I think I remember that. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you you looked at me and you were like, Julio? And I was like, Brandon? And then you put the guitar down, came over, gave me a hug, and and we were friends from that point. Cause I was like, I was like, I don't have to fight this guy, and I know this guy, and and this is uh this is a weird coincidence, but I'll take it, you know? Well, you would have kicked my ass. I was because I, was I wouldn't uh, I probably wouldn't have thrown a punch back, but Trevor loves to fight, so he probably would have fought, yeah. Right, <laughs> right. And I, I planned on losing, but I was just like, dude, like, oh my god. But it was a wild sort of uh, thing that happened to reunite us. And yeah. um and so I sorry. I, <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm happy it did because obviously I know you to this day, man. You know, you're one of my best friends and I keep up with you through the years. And so yeah. I, I'm really glad I, I was a young dumbass who tried to woo a girl in the park with a guitar, you know, instead of just, hey, man, you know, you weren't a, no, you weren't a dumbass. You're were doing, you were doing your thing. I was just an asshole. <laughs> I haven't changed much either. So I, I, I tell, um, you know, in preparing for this uh, for this interview, you know, I uh, I was telling uh, my girlfriend Paige, I was telling her uh, about how I got into a lot of trouble with you, and, and not really even troubles. We didn't get caught. There were no runners with the law, but it was like, you know, probably showing me the ropes to like uh, the ropes of like debauchery as a young adult. You know, you showed me a lot of like, oh yeah, we just drove, to, we went to a strip club together and stuff like that. And I remember. First time you took me to a strip club, uh, I was in there underage, and uh, you bought me a beer, and I thought there was an empty bottle on the counter, and uh, and so I put my cigarette out in that empty bottle, but it turned out to be like a brand new full beer that you uh, <laughs> drank immediately following. I think you almost threw up there in the club, and uh, that's funny. And you still bought me a lap dance after that, you know. Um, By the um, way, I was underage too. Were you still at that time? Oh, yeah, had had to oh, be. My. But see, that's the thing about the valley that I was telling that I was kind of saying, you know, talking about, alluding to earlier. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we kind of broke the law a lot yeah. down there, and not yeah. even thought twice about it. Yeah, it was just something you did. It was like that was it's the wild west, like you said for sure. Um, so. But so when I when I was telling Paige about how like you're we're kind of like an older brother that got me into trouble to show me the ropes of debauchery. I also, um, I also made Great. sure to mention that you were also like a positive influence on me and in that you're the guy that encouraged me to go work for the radio station that you were already working at. And, um, and that kind of like was a trigger that set off in motion the rest of my life actually, because I ended up going to school for audio and all that other stuff and gave you confidence. Uh, yeah, I did, man. Even though, um, even though I was fired for a really dumb thing I did, um, I, uh, you know, I it, so, yeah. So what? Do you want I guess me to what, tell the story? You can totally <laughs> tell this story because I don't even. I, I just know that I got caught and it was really I, I stupid. Don't, I don't remember how you got the job, um, but I remember how you got fired because one of our clients, he not just one of our clients. The biggest client we had, <laughs> uh, he he ran a, a production company, and he, you called him an asshole. 
<laughs> I did. I did. Like in front of I, one of the bosses to the client that was being served. I believe. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, the guy's name was like. I, I, maybe I shouldn't call him out. I guess you know, but he no, was um, probably not. No, no, no. But right, right. Um, <laughs> no, but, not get in trouble. No, again. but I mean, I just had this habit of like you know, not watching my mouth and it's gotten me into trouble and, and less so over the years because I'm a little bit better about it. But when I was younger, I just did not, uh, I, I, I had no filter uh, in that respect. So yeah, I got fired and I actually got fired by the guy who did the voice for Tony the Tiger. And so it was really difficult to be like upset Mijo. about. Yeah, Mijo. Mijo. You know, you're we, fired, we, Mijo. We, we ought to Bitch, let you go, great. But yeah. you're not. You <laughs> but you're not. Balls. <laughs> yeah, man. So it was it was difficult to like even be mad about that. Uh, just as like, how can you, I, how can you be mad about the guy, Tony the Tiger firing you? It's just it's unbelievable. Kind of some of the stuff that went down <laughs> when when you and I knew each other. Um, well, tell me some tell me some radio stories, man. Then we'll get into like the 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 meat well, of stuff. Uh, well, how about a radio story that involves you after you got fired? Oh, well, yeah, well, you went to a different radio station in another town about, I don't know, 10, eh, 10 miles away. Max. Right. right. OK. Um, we were in the, the tallest building in the city and we knew the uh, security guards real well because we'd hook them up with like concert tickets and stuff. So he would let us go on the roof of this huge ass tall building. <laughs> and, and you could see it for like 30 miles, this building. And I called you one day and I'm like, hey, go outside and look at the building. Do you see it? The, the building, our radio station. And you're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, look at the light on the left. And I covered it with my shirt. <laughs> and I was flashing this aircraft light that it was just a solid red light. But for a while it was flashing and, and you could see it, right? Yeah, and yeah, I, I remember that. And I didn't think about it at the time, but people for, you know, miles and miles and miles could see this light flashing. <laughs> you know, that I, and we never got in trouble. We took up a trash bag full of beer and we would just party, party wow. on the roof of this building. And right around the uh, huge powerful antennas <laughs> right, right, <laughs> that, right. <laughs> that you touched with like yeah your your uh your earrings would like get hot and anything metal Whoa. in your body would start to get hot <laughs> 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 that's probably why i'm wearing these now right right uh, right <laughs> That's ridiculous, oh, man. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember that. I remember uh, the light flashing me, and like, what the hell? But I never, you know. That's the thing too is I think that my 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 worldview is so uh, not evolved to where it's like, I mean, who knows what ramifications of flashing a light that's visible for for a thirty mile radius? You know, like what does and, and that? It's the only only really tall building. It's the only one. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's there. Uh, you know, and we never never even like you said never even thought about it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and as for other as for other radio stories, I was backstage with Eminem, uh, Fifty Cent, and Little John in San Antonio, and they had like this VIP area in the back, right? Right. And uh, I was drinking a little bit, of course, and I uh, bought a cigar because I wanted to look cool. So I had the bartender light up the cigar. Yeah. I took one took one puff, immediately turned green, put my hand up like this because I was vomiting. Holy and, shit. And it squirted out the sides, left and right. <laughs> and also because I had my hand like this. Yeah, yeah. You saw his hand the, in the fist. It it went out the front and hit the bartender <laughs> and hit three people. The bartender <laughs> and the people on either side of me. That was supposed to be one of the coolest nights of my life. And if I didn't want to like get arrested or I I I, I vanished. You didn't, they didn't see me the rest of the night. I went and I hid in the general population. Took off my like all state all access pass. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well that's done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm glad yeah, we can laugh. I'm glad we're you know, laughing about this. Right. Well, it's it been... Really, really, it's a sign of sickness, dude. All these stories, you know, wasted. 
Yeah, you know, it's it's funny, man. It's like I have a I have another friend who um I have another friend who is a, a recovered alcoholic. He's been on the wagon after rehab and stuff for a few years now. And he tells me like the best part about being sober is that he can when people bring up stories of what happened when he wasn't sober, he can say things like, I don't know, that wasn't me. That was a different person, you know, and that's kind of how he plays that stuff off. Um, but, you know, and, and it's, it, it's unreal when I talk to people and even mention like, Oh yeah, I used to go drinking with that guy. They're like, really? That guy, he seems like such a good person. You know, like that's what they say. He seems like such a good person. So, um, yeah, I mean it, it's it's kind of tragic all these stories, man. You know, um, I you know you uh, you used to drive a hearse as well. Like your main vehicle for a minute was a hearse, and uh, and, and I know you bought that after like the, the radio station had it for Halloween, and then after Halloween passed, they didn't need the hearse anymore, and they sold it to you real cheap. Club so, Fuego, yeah, club, club it was Club Fuego. That's right. Um, which, what a terrible place Club Fuego is in McAllen, Texas. If anyone's from, like, South Texas is listening, Club it's Fuego. It's still there. It, it is still there. I have confirmed that it's still there. I believe Metropolis is still there as well. Um, Metro- I, I love I love Metropolis. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think job- I ever paid for anything in Metropolis. Nothing. If you're with a radio station, you, you didn't have to pay it for anything. Oh, I mean, God. I was... I was 19 drinking for free in Club Fuego and Metropolis and on the island and and anywhere, really. You know, it was uh, it, it was a crazy time, man, because, you know, all, all in, in my job, all I had to do was drive the van, put some speakers out there and, and blast the hip hop station that, uh, you know, just what they were playing. And I'd staple up some flyers and throw some T-shirts out and the bartenders would just feed me drinks. So. And that was, you know, for like a 19 year old drinking under age to be driving a radio station wrapped fucking van. Um, that was uh, it's the Wild West down there. Um, and, you know, I, I, I live in New York now and these things are just not permissible, not permittable at all. You know, like this no. is it's I all mean, civilized I, and it's fine. You know, but, you remember <laughs> homeboy Hector? We got we got pulled over uh, drinking and driving in the radio van by a cop and he just laughed at us. And let us go. <laughs> yeah, you know? and I, another time i i get, this is just how it is down there i got i i've been lucky of course i got pulled over once drunk of course underage the cop looks at me with his flashlight oh i got the wrong guy went back in his car took off another time underage drunk not my car there were no license plates on the car not expired license plates no license plates what? and the cop and the cops like go home I don't want to see you out here again. I got pulled over in the hearse. This is another time. Uh, leaving Metropolis after having gin and tonic. And if I drank gin, that Ooh. means I was really drunk because usually right. I'm, I'm buzz a beer guy. Right, right, so right. So I smelled like, a, you know, quinine or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was like, well, this is it. I'm going to jail. He's like, uh, the reason I pulled you over is because you can't have red lights on the front of your vehicle. Red lights. He's like, yeah, the eyes glowing in the skull on your hearse are red. <laughs> so I opened, I opened the hood. I ripped out the lights, and he was like, okay, that's it. We'll see you later, dude. Wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So many, t- so many times, I got in two car accidents while I was drinking and driving. Oh, geez. Um, th- both times I was rear-ended, and both times the the police didn't say a goddamn thing. And wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, I mean, I know that I was like rather young back in the days when you and I were partying, but I, you were always like, I mean, I have the, the sign of like a true alcoholic is that, that like they, they hold it together, you know, no matter how much they drink and, and they, I mean, you might've been like 12 to 14 beers deep, but you were still like able to carry on a conversation and be get behind the wheel of a car and, and get yeah. to where you need to go. And it was like this, High level you know functioning, what? despite it, you know. You're you're right, and for a few years, maybe five years, I don't think anyone ever saw me um, not intoxicated. Yeah. So it's I it was kind of my norm. I would have to have at least six tall boys before mm. anyone would see me because I I had to get up get over the shakes, you right. know, and, mm. and uh, the the vomiting 
in the morning the, because, you know, I'm withdrawing. Mm-hmm. And uh, eventually got to the point where, like, I would wake up in the middle of the night, slam a couple of beers just so I could, you know, f- function. Because mm-hmm. if I woke up stone cold sober, man, I was sick as a freaking dog. Mm. And, and, you know, it was bad. So I just kept waking up earlier and earlier. I had to be to work at 10 o'clock. And it got to the point where I was having to wake up at 6 a.m. just so I could drink enough beer that I had that I was normal enough to report to work at at 10 a.m. Right. Wow. So I already had like a, a 12 pack at least. Yeah. So so is this like one of our first sober conversations aside from like Maybe probably just, yeah this right is, this might be our this might be our first sober conversation i mean i've been sober for three uh, three years over three years congratulations thanks man oh, dude so, i mean it's, it's tough man it's like I, I i flirt with alcoholism you know in a lot of ways man like i right now i'm like maybe maybe eight nine days into like not having a drink. Um, uh, but like I, I go and I wax and wane from like maybe going sober for a couple weeks to like drinking nine beers a night at times, you know? Um, and it, it, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that I know that it's, it's, it's really to the, to the detriment of like, of my home life, of my creativity of, and and it takes so much from you. Um, and I don't know, um, if you're willing to go into it or not. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I've already got to like, I've already said some pretty bad shit. Right. right, right, My life's an open book. You know, I'll tell you a story what happened today uh, because I've had kind of like a miraculous you know, uh, yeah, second chance, a new beginning, right. um, a renaissance, whatever you want to call it. And I was supposed to be featured in a magazine that had a has a circulation of 60,000. And um, I turned it down because I really wasn't ready to, to tell my whole story. Uh, wow. You know, to that many people. Right. You know, especially it's, they deliver it to every mailbox in my county where wow. I live. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I told them, look, I, I don't really mind anyone who asks me. I, I'll talk to them about it. Um, but I don't think I should be getting the recognition for something, for being a fuck up, you know, <laughs> and I'm getting all this positive, like, oh, you've overcome so much because I got sick and I ended up getting a liver transplant, but they don't know why I got sick. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where to begin on this, but I, I feel guilty getting any recognition at all from being a, a, a transplant survivor a recipient and like excelling in a field where I get to help people. Um, it makes me look good. But, dude, if you would look at me three years ago, I was bleeding to death on a couch, and I had nothing. Mm. I had just lost my entire family. Um, my, you know, my uh, lady who I called my wife at the time. Yeah. We were together 14 years. I had a 13-year-old kid. Um, that whole life was gone, and I, I thought I was going to die, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was pretty, pretty low, pretty low. Yeah. I mean, folks talked about rock bottom, but it's not like you lost your family and you're going to die and you're not even like, <laughs> you're not even in your own home. You were like, you're probably yeah. on like a family member's couch or something. Yeah. Yeah. In Michigan. Oh, because I had uh, really no one in Austin and I knew Jeez. the Valley was the Valley would kill me. I would have been dead, but right. it, I, I, I thought it was really kind of romantic being an alcoholic and I'm going to drink myself to death. And I kind of accepted that. I was like, Oh, well, I'm just going to die. And then it started happening and it became very painful and scary. And then I thought, well, maybe I don't want to freaking die. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it scared me into wanting to live again. 
So did you did you know that you needed a liver before you went to Michigan? No, no, I didn't <clears throat> because um, I didn't quit until pretty much the day I got here. I didn't quit drinking. So mm. I was like so numb because I was drinking about over 30, 30 drinks a day, 30 wow. beers a day. Wow. And so I really who knows what I felt like my brain was starting to get fried. I, I really I really made me go insane. I was insane. I, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't living on the same planet as everyone else. Um, mm. I was acting weird, you know. Yeah. What were those I, like first few weeks like when you got there? I mean, because you said you you stopped drinking right when you got here, when you got to to Michigan. Um, yeah. What were the withdrawals like, and and did you did you seek like help or AA, or did you just stop? Um, I, I tried AA. I, I'm, you're not even supposed to say you, you did that. Right. <laughs> right. So you're supposed to be anonymous about that shit, but uh, no, one's listening. <laughs> no one's listening anyway. Um, <laughs> and you know, it, it didn't work for me. And, um, so I had, I had no intention of going back to AA and I, uh, I got, my aunt, she found an uncle. They found a place for me to go. Um, it was a six month program mm. and I got there and immediately knew it. I had made a huge mistake. <laughs> <going> <laughs> How, why why this, was it a mistake? Uh, this place was disgusting. It was filthy. Oh. Uh, I was on a plastic mat. And there's bed bugs swarming all over me. I'm withdrawing from alcohol. Um, there's no air conditioning. This is in June. So, I mean, it's Michigan, but it's still hot. Um, I was bleeding everywhere. And that the bed bugs just loved me. And I, I really couldn't leave the bed, really, for the first few days because, uh, because of how sick I was. And not only was I going through alcohol withdrawals, but my liver had failed. And I, I really didn't know. I was yellow. I looked like, like a Simpsons character. Ugh. I had, you know, bruises all over my body. I was in so much pain. I was so tired. Um, and this was a, a Christian recovery place, which, and they gave me no sort of, the, no, no medical care. During this, so wow. I didn't get any. I didn't get any benzos to prevent to prevent seizures. Um, so I I ended up I broke out. <laughs> um, <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. The the second day I was there, um, I, there's some guy down the hall who's having a seizure because he was withdrawing from alcohol, and I, I was really starting to get into the withdrawals on on day two. And uh, some reason when I went in there, I was thinking ahead. And I used an old trick. Um, I shoved a whole bunch of wadded up paper inside of the door because the door automatically locks when you closed it. So when I went in, no one saw me do it. I jammed it in as I was passing by. So I knew there was one door that was unlocked. And I went out that door and I used the phone and I went and uh, I got booze. I Whoa. got I, I got little bottles of um I, for, I think it was Southern Comfort. Uh, and I immediately drank it, you know, not to, to wean me off. And right. they took my cigarettes too, which was, so I was, I was, oh, I was fuck. miserable. Yeah. I was that's miserable. awful. No nicotine, yeah. oh. just cold Turkey. And somehow I made it last. I, I was able to wean myself off while I was there and it was day six. I, I was ready to, I was ready to kill myself. Um, yeah. I already had plans, you know, knew how sure. I was going to do it. I was kind of like on bed rest because I, I wasn't well enough to, to leave, to do all the stuff that everyone else did. So I, there was times, there were times when I was alone and I was planning on hanging myself from the, the top of the bunk, you know, mm. uh, with my belt. Wow, and um, this is where this is the day things started changing for me. Uh, that day, the the place had been open for twenty eight years. 
that day they came in and they shut the place down. Whoa. And just like that, my rehab stint was over. Wow. And I was free. So they, they're like, well, we're going to send you to Flint. <clears throat> to, I'm like, no, you know, I didn't sign up to go to Flint. Right, uh, right. <laughs> it was like, I'm, I'm done. And luckily, I had called and asked for people to come get me out. And no one would because they would tell them, oh, everyone says that. He just wants to drink, blah, 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 blah. Um, he's lying. This place is nice. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> when they came to pick me up, they saw. They saw the shit on the walls. We didn't have toilet paper. Wow. Um, I was, they had Bibles, so I was using Bible paper for toilet paper. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm shitting my, my brains out, of course. Oh, my God. I'm yeah. really sick. Really sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... I told my aunt, I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, to that place that's in the beginning of the phone book. Um, Mm -hmm. once we get home and that's what I did. I found a spiritual program as they call it, Mm -hmm. uh, with the great fellowship and, um, learned, learned how to like live really because I had been drunk so long my whole life. I had been drunk my whole, since I was 15 years old. Right. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to process things. I didn't know how to handle bad days. Mm. I didn't I didn't know how to feel emotions, man, because I I wasn't there. It's like I put my consciousness on hold. Right. Yeah, that's a that's a really uh, yeah. That the way when you say you put your consciousness on hold, I mean, so much of what you feel as a human being is numb by alcohol, and if you haven't had an experience with that since you were 14, 15, it's like a whole, uh, I mean, there is something about life, living life with a chemical buffer though. You know, I mean, everything's, uh, every waking, every waking moment I had booze in me. Right. Oh my God. For years and years and years. And it was enough to, you know, kill me. I kind of succeeded. I drank myself to death. Um, so and for the first six months, I felt sick, um, you know, but it got a little better. And then, boom, all of a sudden, I gained <clears throat> 80, 100 pounds of water. Right. And what sent me to the hospital was that one day my scrotum got to the size of a freaking small watermelon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. Oh. And I'm like, Holy shit. I think I'm going to go to the hospital because I was afraid of hospitals, man. You know, my mom had cancer and stuff. So I was in hospitals a lot. You know, I just I hated everything about hospitals. I hated doctors. Just the, the word health or health care sent me into a freaking panic attack oh. um, because it was something I didn't want to face ever. And um, I'm glad it, it happened here where I went into the hospital because they're like, yo, don't worry, we're going to take care of you. I had no insurance. I didn't have a job at that point. And they're like, everything's going to be okay, man. And I'm like, well, uh, you're going to need a liver transplant. Like, oh, I'm dead. Right, and right. There's no, there's no way I'm getting it. Um, I was already sober six months at that time, uh, which is was a cutoff here or whatever. So if you're sober six months, and I had witnesses... <laughs> <laughs> then, then you qualify, but there's a lot you have to do before you can even get on the list. So I spent the next six months just taking little baby steps. Um, little Every day I gave myself a task of like, okay, I need this scan done. I need to get blood work done for this. And I just took it off in little chunks. I need to get my teeth fixed. I need to go to a dermatologist. Uh, I was constantly busy and lucky, lucky enough, I was still healthy enough to where I could do certain, I could do things to try to save my life. Like I could schedule appointments. I, <laughs> you know, I, uh, right. I could still drive, uh, up until like a month before I got my transplant. Then that's when, I, uh, that's when it almost ended for me. Um, mm-hmm. I got this stuff called hepatic encephalopathy. It's when ammonia builds up in your blood and it passes the blood brain barrier and gets into your brain. So then I had all this ammonia in my brain and I was hallucinating. I don't remember hardly anything. I was acting really weird, doing a bunch of weird shit that I don't remember. Um, 
when the ambulance came to get me, I wouldn't go with them. They called the police. I took a swing at a cop. Apparently, wow. I was restrained. I remember bits and pieces of being in the ER. Uh, and just apparently I was just screaming, leave me alone, leave me the fuck alone over and over and over again at the top of my lungs. Um, <laughs> and I don't wow. know if you knew this. I don't know if you knew this, but to get rid of ammonia, your body shits. You have to shit. So they had to strap me down to a bed and give me a uh, enema to get me to shit. Wow. And yeah, it's called lactulose. It's the most hardcore uh, kind of laxative you'll ever hear about. <laughs> wow. And that, and that was how we got my ammonia level down. But for a week, I was in this li- literal hell. I guess it can't be too literal, but it seemed like mm. it, it seemed like I was in hell. I thought I was in this literal hell. Mm. Um, I thought everyone was trying to kill me. I saw a woman just plain as day come into my room. Mm. point a revolver at me then turn it on herself blow her brains out and her brain and blood was just all over the room and i could smell the gunpowder i jumped up out of the hospital bed and they found me hiding in in the in the shower Uh, i thought i just saw someone kill themselves right in front of me i i saw a, a like a teenage girl light herself on fire and this is real i believe all this is happening like there's i it's like I like guess what I thought an acid trip would be like hallucinating. Yeah, I was, halluc- I was hallucinating all these horrible, wicked things. And w- after a while, after you know, I started getting a little better. I was able to control them a little bit, and then you know, I got kind of fun. I'm like, oh wow, I can control these hallucinations. So I, I flew to Jupiter. You know, and then <laughs> I, I'm like, this is badass. You know, I'm flying through space right now with no space, with no uh, spacecraft. Wow. You know. How did you uh how did you come to the realization that you in fact were hallucinating? Like did did doctors tell you and you were able to just retain that or something? They did, or? They did but I didn't believe them. Um I was I was looking at this centipede that was crawling on my arm, right? A big uh-huh. ass centipede, venomous centipede. And I'm like, no one's believing me. I'm gonna take a picture of this shit. So I got my cell phone. And I, and I pointed it at the, the centipede, and the centipede wasn't there on oh. my screen. I couldn't see it on my screen. And then I'm like, oh, I can tell what's real and what's not real by looking at the screen on my phone. So wow. I, could, I could pan my phone around the room, and it, through the phone, I could see there were no scorpions, and there were no centipedes, and there were no snakes. Uh, the, the room wasn't on fire. Um, through the phone, but if I looked away from the phone, I would still see that damn centipede, and I, I, it was a trip. And I, I remember laughing. I'm like, "Wow, this is the craziest thing I've ever experienced in my life," and I can't believe it. And I, I tried to take pictures and show them to people, and like, I was like, "Check out, there's a guy right there." Took his picture, not on the phone. Wow. So I knew I was. That's when I knew I'm like, "Wow, I'm really hallucinating." Holy shit. And that was like for a week until you received your a week. Your, oh, a wow. week until I shit out the ammonia. Right and at that point, I thought I was dead because they don't give people liver transplants who punch cops. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry for laughing, for, man. That's that's, that's, that's funny. Yeah. And, Holy shit! You know they test you for nicotine. You gotta you. They check you out, man. When they give you a transplant, they make sure you're you're one hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, wait a on. second. Wait a second. Now, now it, it occurs to me now, as I'm just remembering this, as you mentioned, you had to go get your teeth cleaned and stuff. And there is, uh, and I think you and I had this conversation where you told me about how they, like, I guess you have to have clean teeth because they won't give a person a liver that um, has some yeah. sort of disease happening from if the you, mouth if or you something. Have, if you have a cavity, if you have any decay in your in your te- in your teeth it could you could get an infection because you're going to be immunosuppressed after they they give you the new organ to prevent wow. the rejection so if you have an infection in your mouth it could take over and just kill you and wow. i said oh I'll, I'll sign the waiver for that so you know they're like no <laughs> you're, you're playing by you're playing by our rules now uh, so, wow 
that actually getting my teeth worked on is kind of what led to this uh, hepatic encephalopathy flare up that I had because I had lost so much blood um, when they had to pull 10 of my teeth out and my blood, I had no platelets. So I was bleeding to death and I was, you know, it was just bleeding into my, into my GI tract. And wow. so I kind of went into shock and that will cause encephalopathy in a heartbeat. Holy shit. Um, and, and cephalof, I, I forget the, um, encephalophamy. Um, I'm not even saying I'm butchering the Ence- way you said that. Encephalopathy. 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 Um, yeah. is that, is that, that's when the, uh, when the brain swells, isn't it? That's encephalitis. Okay. Okay. So yeah. can, can you, P- pathy means, uh, disease. So basically oh. it means, it means, uh, brain disease, brain damage. Yeah. It's a generic term. But when, when you pair it with hepatic, then it's hep, uh, like hepatitis, hepa, yeah, yeah. Liver, so okay. caused by your liver. Wow. Yeah. Did you um? Did you have any brain damage at all after that episode? I, or I, they said I made a full recovery, but I think I did. I think I Oof. do. I think Oof. I have. Yeah, man. Because, but it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell, man. Because um, you know, I was drunk my whole life, so maybe this is the way I always was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Wow. I I found myself, I couldn't concentrate, you know, and I, I couldn't, and then finally figured out I have, I have ADD. Huh? Yeah. And so I'm being treated for ADD and it was like night and day. Wow. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I, on this stuff called Stratera, it's not a stimulant. uh, It's a neuroepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Okay. And it changed my life, bro. Within like a week, I just felt in control, like focused. And and like, I'm like, now I call it normal. I feel like on point, you huh. know, because I was kind of in la-la land, I guess. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, I, mean, I, got, maybe... I got ADD. I didn't know I had ADD. Maybe it and was. I didn't uh... need any antidepressants after that. I just started feeling good. Wow. Man, that, that makes me so happy to hear that, like, you you know, that night and day difference focused on point. Like, that's just, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy for you. And that makes me, I'm relieved in a lot of ways, man, as I feel like, I, I know for me personally, like, a lot of substance use has been self-medication, you know, self-medicating. Um, and so I wonder to what extent was the the drinking well, on your end just self-medicating, they link, you know? they Well, they link ADD with... Um, uh, nicotine use um yeah i'm sure it had a big part um, i mean that's what i thought i was doing anyway when i drank but i was just trying to get panic attacks out of the way um but right. alcohol withdrawal causes panic attacks because i think back to my first panic attacks i ever had when i was 19 years old i was already drinking pretty hard oh um, wow so they could have been caused by alcohol withdrawal and i'm using alcohol because i know it stopped my panic attacks and they got to the point where I was having them at work and I talked to one of my bosses and about these panic attacks. He's like, man, he, he was a OG, I guess, when it comes to alcohol, he's like, just yeah. bring a flask, bring a flask to work. When you have a panic attack, take the hit off that flask. And I'm a delivery driver, by the way. At wow. This point. Wow. So he's like, yeah. And, and you know what? It worked. And I, I like, I thought to myself, if I do this, I'm an alcoholic. Because I didn't really think I was at that point, but I'm like, if I do this, I'm crossing a line, and right. uh, so that's that's kind of when I gave up. I'm like, a, mm. and I wouldn't go mm. to a doctor, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, know? right. Because uh, uh, so, I was so afraid of so afraid of doctors, you know. So so let me ask and, you this, man. Um, you so. It, when I met you, I was uh, I was a young atheist, right? So, like, I had made up my mind from a young age to, like, thirteen years old or so. I was like, I I am an atheist, yeah, and uh, me too. And, and, and when when I met you, you were you were maybe one of the, the first people in my life that made me feel like it was okay to be an atheist. Um, and I don't know if I ever told you that, but it like it it, it really helped me at that point because. I had pressure from all sides. I had, you know, Tom's family who was like, 
pressuring me into the Southern Baptist, Pentecostal, evangelical sort of thing. Um, and then I had my mom's side of the family who were all Mexican Catholics who thought I was going to hell if I didn't go get my first communion at like, you know, during my teenage years and stuff. Uh, so I know I grew up in a cult. Did you do? Yeah. Did you grow up in something similar? Yeah. Oh. My family was into this, this thing called the Worldwide Church of God, where we followed the Old Testament to the T. Um, lamb's blood on the door. Uh, we couldn't eat anything in Leviticus. Like we couldn't eat shrimp or uh, or ham. You know, uh, wow. we had to keep kosher. And if we didn't, we'd burn in the lake of fire for all eternity. So yeah, I, and I think a lot of a lot of people were raised in a a religious atmosphere that made them feel real shitty about themselves and made them feel scared. Yeah. So I, I mean, it's not healthy, you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's like, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really not healthy to be in that environment of spiritual coercion and, uh, under threat of eternal torment. It's like, not <laughs> right. It's you know, thinking about uh, it. yeah. Um, so my, my question for you though, man, is that like, I know you had to go through like a, you learn to to live again, how to just live through like uh, uh, yeah. some some facilities that a church offered you, you know. But are you still an atheist now, or is this, has this changed any of your perspectives at all? This entire thing you've gone through, oh, dude, definitely changed my perspective. But one thing I've learned is that I, I'm not God. I don't know everything. I, I was a very staunch atheist. Um, I thought you were stupid if you believed in God. Yeah. If or if you were religious at all, I'm like, oh, you're weak. You're a weak-minded person. You need that. Fine. Okay for you. That's good. But man, I've really gotten to the point now where it's like I'm not. I, we, the human race, we're we're basically like dust mites. <laughs> come, come, yeah. You know, we're, yeah. Totally. We're, how in the fuck are we gonna know if there's a god or not? How do we know what we don't know what God is? We we don't even know what. We don't even know what our bodies are made out of, you know. We, right. There's so much we don't know. I'm not. I'm not going to say I'm an atheist because I, I, I do believe that there's a huge universe and we can't even fathom what's in it. Right. Right. There could. Who, who know, there could be a god there, I, and I, and I, I've seen enough. Co- people want to call it coincidences. Coincidences, luck, or. I don't know. It just seems like something like the universe took care of me. We can call it God just to be easier. God took care of me, man. I right. was through this whole thing. Um, I don't know what it was, but we could, I thought we can call it God because, okay. yeah. Wow. Okay. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, I mean, I love you all the same, you know, like yeah. I, well, that's good. You know, like, I'm not going to be like, Oh, you believe in God. You're a weak minded person, Brandon. See, but I still yeah. have a hard time telling myself like, or even using that word. That word <laughs> makes me cringe. That word makes me cringe. It's a loaded right. term, man. Yeah. It, right. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, um, man, we're dust mites. Did I, did I hear that you uh were you hitting on your nurse when you were in the hospital oh yeah anyway i I like hospitals now i love hospitals (laughs) when when i was out i was in the hospital like three different times for about a week um week 10 days at a time uh for the six months before my my transplant and when i was like out of the hospital i found myself missing the hospital (laughs) <laughs> I, I, would, I would drive. I, yeah, because I mean, I was living on a couch, you know, I had my own room in the hospital and I had three right. meals a day and there was all these like beautiful nurses walking around. Um, I got to do interesting shit and I was learning stuff. There was so much to learn. Um, <laughs> yeah, It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Who drives by and the hospital I, and misses it, you know? I did. So like after I got my transplant, which is a, another story, but I'll just sum that up. I was, I got in the hospital, had my transplant. Four days later, I was out. Like five, so maybe six days later, I was driving around, no pain meds. Wow. Wow. Yeah, healthy, healthy Holy man. Holy shit. Wow. 
Um, unbelievably, it went. It was like a textbook perfect, better than you could ever imagine outcome. Yeah. For uh, for some where they chopped my my liver out, this big old slab of meat. They took it out and they put in a new one, and within a week, I'm like feeling better than I had in a decade. I felt wow. like a kid again. Wow. Felt fantastic. That's man. wonderful. Yeah. So I felt good enough. I'm like, well, I'm going to need a job with excellent health insurance. That right. was my goal. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to go to school and work at the hospital. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know. I, like, they've got to have good insurance there at the hospital. Right, right, right. So I looked up the community college, what was, what was in the, what job I could get. And the shortest one, which was supposed to be one semester, was phlebotomy. I'm like, well, I'm going to go be a phlebotomist. Found out it was a year after clinicals and stuff, right? But right. So that that was the shortest amount of time I could do in college to get a, a decent job at the hospital. Right. And so that's what I did. I was on. A, I was technically still disabled, so I I went to school and learned phlebotomy. Um, and I found I love it. I love this job, man. I, wow. I love what I do. I get to I get to work with sick people. I love being around the sick people. Um, mm. I I stick needles in people. Right, right. <laughs> pretty much, right. pretty much all, <laughs> all day. Yeah. Um, I, I do work in the lab as well, so I learned a lot about the lab. Um, I'm I'm. They trust me with one day old babies. You know, and, and yeah. to, to to get blood from little babies, man. That are being wow. born. It's wow. it's a big job. For, it's a big job for someone like me, right? You know, com- coming from rock bottom to having all this all this responsibility because I'm I'm in I'm in people's medical records. It, you know, they trust me to do that. So I, I really I'm really proud of my job now. Wow. And I love I love going to work every day, and and I get to help. I do get to help people. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. And you work and in the hospital. And I got good insurance. <laughs> yeah. And if, wow. and if I drop dead in the hall, there's going to be someone around there to start right. giving me CPR. Right, right, right. You're a lucky man having a health uh, problem in a hospital. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Holy shit. And, wow. You know, I, can, I can relate to, to these people. And you wouldn't believe it, man. I don't know how, what percentage, but it's a very large percentage of people in the hospital that are sick because of drugs. And sick because of alcohol. And, you know, there's people die in their 50s, 40s, 60s, you know, way early because because of of that shit. And I mean, I was in my mid 30s when I, I was 36 when I got my transplant. But I'm definitely not the youngest I've seen in my shoes. I see people like me all the time, every day in there. Wow. And I, I mean, I, I don't really say too much to them i don't really share with them like hey i was i was an alcoholic like you i was bleeding like you i i did this and now like i'm working here i don't really tell it but i can i kind of like sympathize with them and 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 some people i I will tell i'll be like look i was in your i was right in that bed where you were a couple Mm -hmm. years ago Mm -hmm. and life's so much better now you gotta have some sort of hope yeah yeah. If you're in there, if you're lying on in that bed thinking you're gonna die, it's not good for you. Oh my god. Well, that's that's why I wanted to talk to you about all this stuff, man. It's like I I think your story is remarkable, and um, it, it's something that I I felt was worth sharing. Um, you know, I I think there's a lot of suffering going on between like uh, the opioid crisis and uh, every, you know every year I I. I play music whenever there is this festival and it's not COVID seat, you know, when COVID's not around, but like, it's called the hope rocks, uh, festival. It's like, uh, to raise awareness of, uh, of substance addiction in, in youth. And, uh, and they have people, uh, that come in and tell their stories and, you know, that not that their stories are unremarkable. Um, but having known you and what you've gone through, um, your story, in my estimation, uh, is a lot 
maybe maybe they're just being like you know modest about their or, I, mean, I don't think they're being modest I, I just want to say that your story and not that in, not that there's any better or worse it's just different but your story man ranks up there um well, with there's, some there's of not, the craziest you've ever heard about this there's not yeah. a lot like me because i mean my my uh, pa physician's assistant you know works under my doctor right she told me after after my transplant because i was going there on a regular basis getting you know what trying to save my life and yeah. and after my transplant i went in and she's like well you you don't have to be a patient anymore of mine because she was like a, a hepatologist liver doctor she's like your mm-hmm. liver's fine now and and she told me she said you're the first one i've had that lived wow she she'd been doing this six years wow yeah and i'm and i'm the first one that was in her that actually got a transplant and lived wow so man. I, we're kind of rare i haven't met another i mean i've met other people uh, like in the okay when I got my transplant, where I got it at U of M, University of Michigan, they introduce you to transplant patients, so you, you have questions, you can talk to them and stuff. Right. right but right. beyond that, I've never like ran into anyone in my daily life who's had a liver transplant because mm. they were an alcoholic. I, I'm, you know, well, that's you know, not it's not something that everybody gets. So I know it's a rare story. I, I, I you know, I will tell you that I actually, you are one of two people that I know that have received a liver transplant. Um, and I met a guy that I was on the radio with. He, he does a lot of like, uh, he, he spread, spread awareness about organ donations, um, Mm -hmm. and, and being organ donor and stuff. And, um, and I met him, uh, he was going on the radio after me, or maybe he was on before me. I'm not too sure. Um, and I, I don't know if I sent him or sent you his information or what. Um, and I think maybe you had already had like people in your life that you were obviously working with, uh, you know, so I don't know. Um, uh, and I, and I know I've probably, I've also in, because we're living in fucking 2020, I've also had some, uh, I've also had some rough uh, Facebook encounters with the guy. Um, yeah. He's not he's not on my block list, but he's someone that I have insulted uh, in an ad hominem sort of way. Um, not about the liver or something, but about politics. Um, but yeah, man, um, I you're right. They're rare. I didn't realize they were that rare. That's that's fucking crazy. That like Maybe you were the not. first one. Well, I mean, but, the first one in six years. I, I think about yeah. you know that nurse who is sort of within this like she basically she does that job, for a living yeah and but she has to watch you know her patients expire over the course of years and a lot of them drink so, man a lot of right, them drink right and they've got these new alcohol tests now that they could tell if you drank within three weeks so so it's not like they're checking blood they're checking for metabolites of alcohol in your system so they'll know if you drank wow and i I'll, it's that that that's probably the biggest part of my story is that I was a, I'm able to stay sober for three years, right? But but the way the way I tell people like how did you do it? Well, there's that there's that place in the beginning of the phone book. Um, but also it's kind of like I, I think it would be very rude. <laughs> I was if I started drinking now again. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. If you start very disrespectful. Right, right. Yeah. And there are people that have, you know, relapsed after they've got an organ. Um, so I I gotta I gotta be confident and content like that with my sobriety, like okay, good. I have three years, I'm doing good. I gotta feel like that, but also I can't forget how easily like this I could pick up a drink today tonight and and be dead within a, a couple months you know right it it could happen to i i i, I don't think it could it would but I, hey man i'm like i said i don't know everything i don't right. know what, what would make me drink again but i got this i have this awesome organ that was given to me i don't want to fuck it up so right and, right if i if i didn't get sick i would probably still be drinking yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I, I think you got people in your life right now. Like, if you picked up a drink right now, they'd 
be at your doorstep knocking on your door being like, what the fuck are you doing? You think that? Nah, I I don't think so. Mm. Well, I mean, I got, I got, I got a girlfriend who's great and I love her. Right. Um, I know she would be, but that's something that doesn't really matter because if you want to, like the first time I went, when I went to to try to stop, you got to be ready, man. You really have to be ready. You have to really want to stop because it's not easy. If you don't want to do it, it's, it's too hard. To, it's too hard to do it if you don't want to. <laughs> right. You got to be done. I was done. I'm done. Mm. I, I, I wanted to change. Right. I was like, the, well, the last years of me drinking, I, I didn't want to do it. I had right. to. Right. I had to, even if I had the flu, I felt like shit or whatever. I'm like, I am not drinking today, but a few hours later, I have to drink because I'm, I'm getting so sick. Fuck. That, you know, so yeah. it's like I was, tra- I was trapped. I was oh. trapped in that cycle of drinking. I had to do it. Wow, man. Wow. Oh, so I don't know if anything I've said today makes sense. No, it, it totally <laughs> makes sense. And I just, you know, and I, and I really, I'm, I can't, you know, express my appreciation enough to like, you know, thank you for just laying it all out there. Um, so you, you got this, this new lease on life. You got this new livery. You got this newfound sobriety. You got a girlfriend new job. loves you. New job. You got a career. Man. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like, it's, I'm in it's touch with my kid. My kid comes up and sees me twice a year. Right. Um, for a week or two at a time. I just did a bucket list thing this summer in August. I, I drove to Montana and stayed in Wyoming uh, for a couple of days, saw the mountains. I'd never seen mountains before. Um, oh, wow. I mean, all the things that are happening in my life are just awesome. And I, I'm not I'm not really afraid to say that because if if anyone hears this is having a really shitty time. There, there is hope. I mean, I got a badass sports car. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like tuned up with like, oh man, it's a uh, WRX Subaru WRX. Wow, man. man. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I got a nice watch. Check that out. <laughs> that is a nice watch, man. So, I, I mean, I've been blessed. I've been blessed to come back from where I had nothing, and I still, I'm not rich or anything, but dude, I can afford to eat. I'm off of all public assistance. It, Even that's a journey you know? to come back from, man. I mean, getting off of public yeah. assistance is not as easy as it as it sounds, you know. So, oh no, man, I, I, I'm not disabled anymore. I, they sent me papers to renew my disability. I threw them away. I'm like, I'm, I, I don't need it. Wow. You know? yeah. yeah. Holy shit, dude. So I and I've seen now you're doing like drone photography. Are those the mountains you went to see in like Montana or something? Yeah, yeah. That's well, I, I don't drink anymore, so I got to do something. Right, and right. That's what I'm in. That's what that's what I've been into for I don't know. Um, I guess uh, almost a year now. I've been flying drones, and it's really pretty out here in Michigan where I live. I live right on Lake Michigan. Right. Um, it's a beautiful place to sober up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, rec- I recommend it. Oh, and maybe I'll plug my Instagram. It's at B R A V I L L Braville. Brandon yeah, fo- follow Brandon on Instagram for drone yeah. photography, pictures of mountains, yeah. and um, I, I don't I think sell the, any of them or anything like that. But you can just see what I'm up to. I mean, when I when I look at your photos that you take, man, I'm I'm not even like. I mean, they're incredible photos, but it's also like that's my friend, and he shouldn't be here, and. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's taking these, like he's in these beautiful places, and yeah, all this shit that I haven't seen yet, you know, and and don't think that I, like, I take it for granted. Like when I see something pretty, I'm like, Jesus Christ, I can't, I, I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even seen that. This shouldn't have happened to me, man. I should be dead, or I should be in jail. Oh my God, man! Right, one of the two. Yeah, yeah. and you know what? When you wake up in a shitty mood. And you're in the shower and you're getting ready for work. You're like, I got to go to fucking work today. I, I immediately think, oh, I get to go to work today. Oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm not, I, I get to, you know, I'm not like, I'm not stuck on, on the couch bleeding to death, getting uh, eaten alive by bed bugs and lying in a pool of my own vomit, bloody right. vomit. You know, right. I'm, I'm walking, 
I'm walking around. I'm on my two own two feet. Yeah. Yeah. So everything else, everything right now is just like a bonus. It's it's hard. It's hard to be depressed right now. It really is. Well, I I think that um, bad days, but you know, I think there's a, a direct correlation between like the significance of a new start tied together with the uh, significance of helping people in what you do for a living. Cause wouldn't it be a shame if like, I mean, if you were, I mean, not that like ditch digging isn't necessary for society, but if you give a person a new liver, then they have to go dig ditches with it and they don't want to go to work and they're not inspired to live their life. And that's what they, you know, it's, um, it's, it, I'm glad that you found something meaningful out of, you know, or or at least I'm yeah. glad that that you sought out and found meaning with this that, new sort of that, you know, lease another, on life. That's another thing I I learned uh, that I had to learn. It it didn't come natural for me to be like, oh, you help people, you feel good. But I, yeah, that's what I was told to do. Right. Whenever you're feeling shitty about yourself, help someone else. It'll make you feel better. And I also, I, I don't know if this is cliche or what, but I heard it's, it's hard to have a bad day when you have at least one thing to be grateful for. And mm. that, that's something I really take to heart, just, just to be grateful for it. everything I have. And I, I am grateful for it. So it's really hard to be in a shitty mood when I'm happy to have what I got right now. Yeah, man. Well, listen, man, you are one of my oldest, longest running friends, and I have watched you over, um, through social media go through the things that you went through. And um, and I'm not kidding, man, when I say like I that, that festival that I go to every year, the Hope Rocks thing, uh, which I've been I've performed at a, a few times. But like when, I, when I've there's nothing but speakers all day that tell stories that um but Sign I, but me I, up, man. I'll go tell my story over there. Maybe I'll be a little more eloquent next time too. Cause. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, <laughs> I would definitely love to hook you up with those folks, man. Because, uh, uh, and the other guy too that I argue with on Facebook that got the liver or whatever that I met. Um, because I, I think, I mean, just just in you telling the story, I mean, there, there's, I'm not, I'm not putting down other similar stories. I'm just saying that yours and the details that you've told me, I knew would be this sort of. A amazing transformational sort of narrative, man. I mean, it's it's some it's it's unbelievable. The uh, I Jules. mean, just <sighs> Jules. Yeah, I'm, I'm still the I'm still the asshole who tried to steal your prom date, bro. I know you are. And that's the thing about it, too, man. <laughs> no, I haven't changed that much, bro. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I'm just real lucky. All right. Well, listen. I hope that you know. Lately, I've been. Because I've 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 tried to, I've been, I've been focused on so many negative things that I've tried to take this podcast into a realm of telling stories that have a resounding sort of positivity to them, and, and I hope that you know within uh, these darker days that are that we're living through now that we find ourselves in, I'm hoping that my listenership can, you know, take some inspiration and positivity and uh, and hope from your story. I hope and so. That's, I hope so. That's, that's, that's what I'm about, man. Positivity. That's great, man. Stop, stop whining, you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not, we're not editing that part out. Oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, man, I am going to hit uh, stop on the recording now, but before I do, I want to say thank you for telling your story and thank you yeah, for being man. so open you, about it. I love you too, man. And I'm the world's a better place with you here, brother. And I'm, I'm just, it, it makes my heart swell to know that you're still here and that you have a an optimistic uh lease on life and you're doing things that you know i if, you know the brandon that i knew wouldn't be uh out taking drone photography we'd be finding a campfire or something like that to to just get wasted around and and i'm just glad to yeah. see you know a twinkle in your eye of happiness brother so thanks man thanks Jules. yeah man good to be yeah, here man yeah dude sign your organ donor cards 
Well, that's it for episode 10 and my conversation with Brandon Villarreal. As always, if you'd like to send any comments, concerns, criticisms, or vitriol, you can send those directly to the show email at noeasyanswerspodcast at gmail.com. Support for No Easy Answers comes from listeners just like you, so if you have not done so already, please consider becoming a supporter of No Easy Answers at www.anchor.fm forward slash noeasyanswers and click the support button. Until next time, take care, all my guys, gals, and non-binary pals.